and uh, you yeah. Can... So I'm going to start by introducing Michaela right now. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. All right. It's perfect. All right. So welcome, welcome everyone, um, especially friends from Taiwan, ta Taipei, and from Tainan a few, and from um, Japan, and friends from Singapore, friends from Thailand. Um, welcome for tonight's event. It's Taipei Ethereum Meetup event. Um, we usually do it in a, in a physical space with like a physical event, um, be, but because of COVID-19 situation, we sort of like, you know, some changes and like innovate with our event planning. So thanks very much for Ikara for joining us tonight um, from Toronto, Canada. And thanks very much for Susan, yeah. Yeah, CC, <laughs> for <laughs> making all the effort to rent this very beautiful place and part of the equipment setup, um, becoming even more professional every day. <laughs> every event that we we um, co-organize uh, is is really helping helping us to improve in terms of equipment. Um, so tonight's event, uh, there's like a specific topic that we want to talk about. So Mikara prepared this very, very interesting and informative uh, presentation slides that everyone can can take a look at afterwards. Um, the topic is Ethereum access privacy, and I'd like to give a little introduction of the speaker tonight. Um, so Mikara Quintine Collins, um, she's a prominent researcher. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Hashbook. Um, it's a blockchain privacy um, startup uh, with a global team. And her research focuses on um, networking, validator privacy, and optimistic roadups. And I met Mikara um, in Prague um, 2018 at DEF CON. Um, I only met her very briefly, like sort of like this uh, acquaintance. And then I met her again um, in Osaka, Japan um, last year, right? Yeah. yeah. So last year we went to, we went to Osaka before this DEF CON Ethereum conference event again, and we met sort of like um, at a coffee shop where we had sort of like the afternoon tea. And she was like ordering all the food and like desserts in Japanese, which blew my mind. Um, and then we met again this year in Paris, France um, for another Ethereum conference called ECC. Um, she again ordered everything in French which blew my mind again. <laughs> yeah, and then she said something like she re was really interested in learning Mandarin, and sort of, we sort of keep in touch. Um, so I'm happy and very honored to uh, introduce Mikara to tonight's event. So, Mikara, I think you can take it away now. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. Can the live stream hear me? Can the live stream hear us? I think yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think they yeah. can. Yeah, I have okay. another and cell phone. Yeah. Is it smooth? Uh, yes, sounds smooth. Like, am I breaking in and out? Okay, okay. okay. Well, thanks for the for the intro. Um, yeah, anecdotes are always interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm Kira. Um, it's morning where I am, so I will not be showing my face. Um, but I'll have a morning face. Um. But yeah, today I'll be talking a little bit about things I've been thinking about with regards to um, accessing the Ethereum blockchain from an ordinary perspective. Um, so yeah, the main goal of this talk is really just to bring the problem of accessing Ethereum privately to um, a wider audience. It's not something that many people think about. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, you can ask them at the end and then at the end, I also have ways in which you can stay in touch if any of these things are interesting to you. Um, so the main motivation behind looking at this is that uh, currently on Ethereum, everything on chain is mostly pseudonymous. So um, that means that you only have on chain, you have these on chain identities um, known as addresses, um, and you can create many many of these addresses, um, but after repeating... Um, so can we start okay. by your motivation? Yes, this slide. Yeah. So I guess people have had enough time to read this slide. Uh, so I'm just going to breeze through it, but yeah, anything on chain on Ethereum 
uh, is on chain. And after repeated use, we can see your financial life and history. Um, this isn't really optimal. So there's been, you know, a few solutions to being deployed this year to kind of solve that. But none of these solutions take into account uh, the privacy, the network layer. Um, and all of this is kind of symbiotic. So if you're trying to do something on chain, you need to uh, make provisions to handle things off chain at the network layer. Otherwise, you'll just undermine, you know, all the audits and effort you put into uh, deploying your privacy specific mechanism of people. So today, it's going to be a relatively short talk. Uh, so we'll pretty much cover the Ethereum push for node. Um, and effectively, what we're going to cover is how people publish to, to Ethereum, and then how people query for relevant like, transactions. From Ethereum. And then as we go through and see how uh, there's certain issues from a privacy perspective um, that currently there aren't many solutions for. Uh, so what this talk is not about, it's not about on-chain privacy techniques. So I won't be like specifying any particular technique or comparing and contrasting them, none, none, none of that. Um, but I will be, you know, saying, I will bring it up often throughout the talk, but I, I won't like, single out any particular techniques or anything. So, um, you can purchase the network. It's one of the like, these mysterious things about Ethereum. Nobody really understands why or how it works, um, even though this expects. So this is like an overview of what just a like blockchain um, topology looks like, a blockchain topology looks like. Um, it's not specific Ethereum. The credits are from blockchain access privacy paper that's in the meetup page. Um, so pretty much the Ethereum credit pen network um, is made up of different kinds of nodes depending on their resource requirements or their role in the network. Um, and these sort of nodes make up a creator for network, so everybody is both a client and a server. Um, and the main focus of this talk will be how you know, these, these light nodes sort of announce transactions to the network and how they retrieve transactions from the network. So it then uses um, their P2P which is a set of protocols for uh, managing different aspects of the Ethereum peer network. Um, so they're made up of a bunch of protocols. I'll just like name a few of the relevant ones. Um, so ROPX is a TCP-based um, communication protocol for message, messages to communicate over. Um, it's encrypted and authenticated. Um, which only provides confidentiality. Um, I get into that a little bit later. Um, there's the no discovery protocol. Currently, what's deployed on Ethereum is known as Discovery V4. However, there's a draft specification for Discovery V5, which is going to be deployed on these two nodes soon. Um, so, as its name states, no discovery, the no discovery protocol is for discovering other peers in the network. Um, this is done through using a like, um, DHT with a few changes. Um, and this is run over GDP. Uh, next up is the Ethereum wire protocol. Uh, so this specifies the actual messages that pairs need to exchange between each other um, so that they can retrieve certain kinds of information depending on whether they're still in the network, um, if they're propagating transactions and, and whatnot. And then there's the light Ethereum sub protocol, which is a protocol for um, Nodes or devices to interact with the critical pin network without having to store the entire chain. So, first we'll start with publishing to Ethereum. This is a, a straightforward case that I suspect that many people are familiar with. Um, so, yeah, so uh, Ethereum is a, it's a global distributed network, and so an easy way to propagate messages to all the pairs in this network is by means of gossip. Um, and one of the main issues with using gossip is that a lot of these gossip protocols are based on what is known as um, epidemic broadcasting. 
um, effectively what this means is that um, the behavior of gossip in a caterpillar um, mirrors the behavior of epidemics um, and how like viruses spread. And so, and it's not in the slide, but I'll, I'll say it. Uh, and so like one of the issues with using gossip is that a lot of the techniques that people use for analyzing um, the spread of epidemics and viruses in, in nature can be applied in this context as well in order to find who originally propagated a message. Um, so that's one, one issue with um, publishing to here. Um, another issue is the current protocol has no provisions for anonymity. So um, anybody could just um, analyze the traffic and they just sit on, on both ends of the node. So they'll listen to, say, your, your cell phone, your wallet, and then they'll listen to several nodes in the network to see if they receive your transaction. Um, and then they can easily sort of correlate the times and other metadata regarding your uh, transaction. Sorry. Regarding your transaction to, uh, to store it somewhere for whatever per purposes they're doing this work. So in other words, uh, publishing to Ethereum is a traffic analysis system. So uh, you can also, um, as an adversary, sort of, uh, how can I explain this to you? Uh, it's without a picture. Yeah, so you can create messages in such a way, and create packets in such a way that you can infer information about sort of the state of the network at a particular time. So yeah, again, you're listening on both sides, and but this time you craft the message in a particular way so that at the other end of of the network, you look for the same pattern because since you crafted the, the packet, you know what to look for. You could look for the same use of patterns in communication um, in packet format at the other end of the network. So that's uh, another privacy issue for publishing to the um, So there have been solutions to that, that have been proposed not only mostly in the context of Bitcoin, but there's been a few proposals to sort of adhere to a positive blockchain. Um, those usually include Tor and ITP networks, which are both onion routing protocols um, that are very popular and people know about them. Um, there's been a lot of research and debates up about the use of these, these networks um, for a blockchain. So a lot of the, if, if you potentially let the the paper beforehand uh, that's in the, the meat of description uh, in the blockchain access privacy by Brian Harry and we at all. Um, it mentions that Tor, one of the family uh, censorship resistant in that in, in the sense that uh, it's possible for organizations and governments to wait, uh, but okay, Mikhail, we couldn't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And is the sound any better? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds better. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it's almost at the end of talking with this slide. Um, yeah. So there's a. Uh, back to back to. Yeah. So there's um, some attacks that can, sort of, defeat the purpose of using Tor or ITP. That's not not if you're like kind of implement. The protocol properly will not implement uh, use the protocol properly. Uh, for example, um, a precaution one should take when using Tor with a light client should be that uh, for every transaction that you send, you need to create a new circuit. And in Tor, that just means um, creating a new connection to Tor. Um, and that does cause like a significant like, user experience um, problem for, for many like, normal users. But for more privacy conscious users, uh, I don't think they, they would mind this like, with extra stuff. Um, but it's better to do it this way as opposed to sharing the connection because um, if you're using the same circuit, you can sort of uh, be de-anonymized um, by like, other actors on the Tor network that way. 
company. Uh, another issue with with core is um, that it's not uh, I'm ready. it's not uh, resistance to global, global passive, passive adversaries. Um, this just means it's it's not resistance against like, the NSA or any sort of government agency that has multiple nodes on the Twitter network, multiple exit nodes on the Twitter network that can afford those resources. Um, so depending on the threat model for your light client, it may not be the best for um, the uses of the potential light client. Uh, another solution that comes up a lot is Dandelion++. Plus Plus. Um, so Dandelion++ Plus Plus was constructed in the context of Bitcoin, and one of the main goals of its design was to sort of take advantage of Bitcoin's like, current infrastructure um, for the way Bitcoin nodes um, propagate messages across the network, which is also classic base. Um, and instead, it provides like, st statistical obfuscation of like, the source of um, the transaction. Um, so it pretty much also takes advantage of what I um, brought up in a previous slide, which is like epidemic, um, which is like rumor propagation of protocols for seeing how those um, operate in the real world. Um, one of the downsides of Dandelion Plus Plus is that um, it's only secure against a very weak adversary. So in, in the case of Tor, it's secure against a local passive adversary, but Dandelion++ is something even weaker adversary than that. Um, and so depending on the use case for, I'm sorry, the, the threat model for users of a particular kind of light client, um, this may not provide the best privacy guarantees. However, Dandelion++ is simple to understand and from, um, at the protocol layer, that was one of its design goals. So a lot of projects lately have been have been adding it in. Um, another caveat with Dandelion is, as it was designed for Bitcoin specifically in the way Bitcoin um, populates transactions, um, some changes would need to be done to some of um, some parts of the protocol to make it work with different blocks. And um, there's been not recently, but the last year, I guess, um, the project then had encountered some, uh, they were saying the anonymization. You just said, like, a, a little, like, yeah. brief, like we, brief we, summary. As I remember, we, we talked about, like, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was yeah, 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 Dandelion Plus West. Yeah. And I was going to talk about Blender. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and yeah, yeah, so Dandelion Plus Plus is, uh, that popular being deployed, um, be careful about using it for um, Ethereum simply because it was designed for Bitcoin and so some changes need to be made in order to make sure that you get similar privacy guarantees um, as um, proved in the paper uh, and it's easy to implement. Uh, that's pretty much the gist of what I was saying. Is that okay? Uh, yes, that's okay. Um, yeah, so next is Blender, which came out this year. Um, this one's based on MPC, um, and it's only a prototype. It hasn't been deployed anywhere. There's a prototype on GitHub. I should have added a link to it. Um, and yeah, this provides like anonymous broadcast for for character networks. Um, well, it can it can work in the paper pay case and the paper they present in the client server case, uh, and also it, it provides um, a few provisions for uh, private private information tool, which we'll go a little bit into today at this time. Um, and so yeah, the, one of the main issues with Blender is uh, the cost associated with NPC, um, and yeah, compared to say Dandelion, it's not as easy to implement. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if part of this is for, for a pricing facility like that. So, uh, that's it. Uh, so now we'll talk about fetching transactions from Ethereum. Um, so, like, like clients, um, in order to 
ensure that they're not sending the transactions to whatever node and make sure, and to make sure that it's in an other direction, they need to be able to verify that, that the trend, the one that the chain that they're sending to is like the correct chain. And two, they want to verify past transactions, all right? So any like popular mobile client, even if it has a list of your past transactions that you've made with bank snaps and all that information, um, and that's done through like querying a, a, a chain. So I'll go through some of the issues with, uh, some of the privacy issues with, with the current. Um, so there's a variety of like syncing protocols on Ethereum. Uh, fast sync and being scarred for syncing a chain with a full node. Um, and they both take advantage of the Ethereum, the Ethereum white protocol that I discussed earlier in today's time. Um, but yeah, they're, the way they, they send messages is for the most part the same. Um, and then LES has its own protocol. It's also based on the Ethereum uh, um, protocol, but makes make some changes for like, low resource devices. Um, so effectively, the way these work, um, oh, and I like to note that fast and convenient sync are their PTP protocols, but I put them here. Uh, yeah, so the gist of how they work is that um, first, like, the client connects um, to the usual methods. Um, to to the Ethereum printer print network, um, and what it will do, it will request um, block headers with a with the total amount of difficulty done on that block in order to verify that it worked. And then, depending whether it's um, the LDS um, protocol or one of these other syncing protocols, um, it'll store it'll ask for more for more information to ensure that. You can verify all the blocks. And in the case of LES, um, this is not done for every block. Um, it's done for uh, every few, like every like few thousand blocks. Forget the exact number. Um, but uh, in the other cases of the other um, protocols, it's done like quite frequently. Um, and it's in the case of LES. They also look for transactions in the blocks. This update that we all know in our uh, have these like um, timestamps of transactions that we've done and whatnot in our mobile wallets. Um, so the privacy issues with with many of these uh, protocols is that um, we can see who is doing the query. So like I said previously, the all the connections are authenticated and encrypted. That only provides a uh, confidentiality. You can still see who's doing um, the query uh, on the network, provided that they're not using an anonymizing network, such as for or whatever else. Um, and on top of being able to see who is doing what, you can also see what they're querying for. So in the case of the lifeline, you can see what blocks that they're interested in. Um, because these the blocks that they're interested in either have transactions that they've seen before that the that wallet has done before, um, so we can easily correlate uh, the addresses that belong to a particular wallet and the accounts and addresses that correlate to a particular wallet, um, and this yeah, and, and then we can also see in the case of Ethereum, not only do you see sort of amounts being sent or just transactions. We're also seeing what kind of applications users are, are doing. Um, so uh, an example of this would be, say you're a user who's using one of a, an identity DAO, and this identity DAO is somehow tied to like a real life identity, then uh, an adversary can easily link your this like on-chain identity that's not to a physical identity to a set of addresses that's owned by you. Um, this is vastly different to the Bitcoin case where all you want, all a user wants is like their, whether you know, they own certain sets, certain UTXOs and whether they've been spent or whatnot. 
when you hear the use case of being the one computer or uh, whatever the following of these things. There's much more that can make from a privacy perspective um, about if it uses on-chain activity with what's being done at the node layer. Um, so yeah, in this case, if there's like some on-chain application that wants to, that you want to like, participate in, such as an identity that of some sort, then using so an adversary can just like, map these two, these identities together at the network layer and sort of make a port follow here. Um, and even if you're using like multiple different addresses on chain and you're using like mixers and um, other privacy presenting tools, the simple fact that somebody can just look at what you're being, what you're querying and um, derive a ton of information and metadata that way is quite concerning. Um, so there actually aren't really any solutions to this. So right now on Ethereum, um, there's been some academic work, but the use case isn't for um, like finds, but it's for like data analysis. Um, so it would have to be changed for for um, the like find use case. And then the usual solution of Tor doesn't really help here because um, it doesn't hide the contents of the query. It just hides who is doing the query. Um, so yeah, this is an uh, area of research that uh, I think uh, the people of this talk should consider working. Um, and then this other work that's not directly applicable to, to blockchains that would be useful here. So uh, Simple RS is a project by Cash Matter. Um, and their goal is to build a uh, ITPR protocol. Sorry, it's not an ITPR, sorry. It's a computational PR protocol. Um, for privacy preserving DHP queries. Um, so this could um, potentially help with like, more privacy preserving you node know, discovery and other such applications. Um, but how, SQL press is a, is a work in progress, um, but eventually they could, they'll be able to get to boards and uh, this library can be used across the projects and it'd be really interesting to see it in, use, in this use case. Uh, so I'm going to show myself for a bit. Um, so I tweeted this out like a while ago, um, and I was already working on mixed notes, and so recently I decided to work on PR. Um, for those of you who don't know, PR is stands for Private Information Approval, and there's sort of like two branches of PR. There's computational PR, and then there's um, information theoretic PR. And they both have different trade-offs and different use cases of when you use them. Um, so in computational PR, PR, you're usually interacting with a single server. Um, and the privacy is guaranteed by high, is the hardness of certain cryptographic um, uh, primitives. Um, whereas in the case of ITPR, it works in the multiple server setting. Um, and privacy is dependent on the servers and on uh, Basic information here with uh, guarantees. But in, in fact, its PR hasn't really been deployed before, um, regardless of whether it's in the blockchain industry or anywhere else. Um, so, uh, PR is like a compelling use case for, for blockchains. Um, hopefully, I kind of convince that for this time. Um, so, currently, I'm working on Mason, which is a mixed net for cryptocurrency transactions. Um, it's not production ready, but it is like alpha status. Um, we're running it right now. Um, and so our current work mainly focuses on making it easier to uh, use and decentralizing certain um, components of the system. Um, we support like APM forks like e ETC, um, the, the main popular testnet, testnet screen being Gorley um, and Banach Bananchain. Um, since we got a grant from the Binance Finance Fellowship. Um, and so, yeah, it's currently running. Um, it's quite hard to use as a user if you want to send transactions over. Um, but we're currently working on trying to make that a little bit easier. Uh, and if you want to participate as a node in, in the Mason network, it's also a bit hard. So, we've been working on tools to make that easier as well. Um, 
if you want more information, you can check out our GitHub. Um, and we have like other reports associated with the project as well. Another thing that we've also recently started is Barion, um, which is a, meant to be a library for ITPR protocols. Uh, it, I just started a few weeks ago, uh, and it's meant to be sort of this general purpose um, library for prototyping, maybe. Um, if there's a, like a wider audience that wants to use it, I'll try to make it more production ready. But the main goal for, for us is we want to start prototyping some ideas around um, fetching transactions from Ethereum more privately. So we want to build out a library of various ATPR protocols that we can experiment with. Um, yeah, so this is uh, like an infant in, as a project. So yeah, we'd be uh, interested in getting more feedback and, and stuff from users who might potentially bump this for their use case. Uh, yeah. So we're ending, or almost there at the end. Um, so yeah, the main two research questions that I'll bring up is, uh, how can we like, better leverage sort of how Ethereum works and how Ethereum propagates transactions to create protocols that are more privacy preserving? Uh, the reason for spreading it this way is because trying to deploy a whole new like, anonymity network takes a lot of time. Um, as somebody who's currently trying to deal with the mixed net. Um, and it'd be interesting. It takes on that, not only a lot of time, but it's also easier to implement. You can write like an EIP and, uh, you know, show it to the court devs and have it implemented. And it'd also be an interesting research problem for anybody who's like a graduate student. There's a lot of like, proposals in academia for things that could be applied here. Um, and it has like a segue into being potentially applicable in, in real life. Um, if you're a grad student who doesn't just want to publish papers, but who wants to make sure the work can get implemented. So this is like a good leeway for that. Um, and then the second point is, um, as I mentioned earlier, ITPR, uh, not only ITPR, but CPR protocols are uh, quite inefficient. But there's been many advances in in their PR liter literature label, um, that if combined together can potentially be used for, um, yeah, that can be useful for blocking networks. Um, so it'd be interesting to see the constructions of new PR protocols that uh, take into account the dynamic nature of blockchain networks, um, the rationality assumptions, the trust assumptions, and all of that, um, and and they build this out. In so those are like the two main research questions that I'd like to sort of bring forward for the audience. So in, in conclusion, uh, so stack privacy is already hard on a, on a public blockchain. Um, if you sort of neglect the networking layer, you, you inadvertently destroy any like, on-chain, well not completely, but you definitely destroy love with on-chain privacy um, mechanisms that are being deployed, especially if they're being deployed on something that's already public. So, like a lot of enemy sites aren't as large as one would think. And then the other uh, point here is uh, nobody has really solved how to privately publish or query from the theory. In terms of the like academic research in this regard, the field has been kind of neglected. So it'd be really interesting to see how uh, informally write about the actual privacy guarantees of uh, the current protocols and some actual proposals to really um, fix that. Um, so that's the end of the talk. Um, you could follow me on Twitter. I'm a, I'm a Twitter hiatus for a little bit. So you can follow me, you can send me an email. Um, I'm also on Telegram. It's just my first name, Nikira. Uh, and I made up this. I made this whole list a while ago, and it's to be updated since it has been updated in like nine months. Um, but yeah, this was just the basics of um, various uh, things related to privacy on blockchains. And yeah, you can give it a star. Hopefully, it helps you like, learn more about uh, privacy on blockchains and stuff. Sort of the issues that um, occur in cryptocurrency networks. 
yeah, that's the end. Thanks very much, Mikara. So I've got questions for you. Oh, do you really? Or are yeah. there questions? For you? Yeah. Um, so the question is about ITPIR that you mentioned in this, during during the presentation. Um, the yeah. uh, information theoretic private information retrieval, and you mentioned that you recently have an infant project. Yeah, that's related to it. Can you tell us more about that in terms of ITPIR specifically? Um, so the the project um, Baryon is meant. Yeah, like I said in the talk, it's meant to just be sort of this like library of popular IT. I don't know if they're popular per se, but um, well-cited IT PR protocols. Um, so what else can I say about it? Because um, you well, think, we, well, you, you think it's, it's probably the most applicable to Ethereum today, right? Yeah, considering that um, many people aren't really um, you don't really want to trust one node, which you might have to do in like computational PR, and also the computational PR methods are quite inefficient today. Like the best ones all require lattice-based cryptography, whereas ITPR like don't require like that kind of cryptography, but they're also quite in inefficient on the server. Mm. Uh, but there's been some work that hasn't been open sourced or potentially may not have not made any code for it that can be applied to like older PR protocols. Um, oftentimes these um, improvements are based on uh, Ian Goldberg's like, seminal PR paper from 2007. Um, and there's an implementation for, for that particular protocol. So our goal is to just implement those protocols in just a way that's like open source and, and public so that it can help with PR research and like trying to apply this in, in the context that we want to apply this, which is like retrieving transactions from a blockchain. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so CC Liang, he's also got some questions for you. Uh, well, it's... Um, when... You have to be closer to the microphone a bit. Um, all right. <laughs> Let me think what's my um the yeah can be um give the in a in a motivation part um you mentioned that uh we have current we have a lot of on-chain privacy solutions but they are like vulnerable to the network label denormalization and yeah can you give an example of uh that like um what kind of uh, like like uh, ancient privacy uh, solutions? Uh, maybe say okay. that yeah. Okay. Um. So, for example, like Tornado Cash just deployed recently. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's like probably one of the most popular ones. Uh, Aztec also deployed, but they only provide confidentiality. Um. They're gonna be providing anonymity in the future, uh, uh, and then there's like these opt-in protocols that make claims about privacy as well for Ethereum. So I can give an example to better illustrate sort of the, the issues with just considering the on-chain um, parts. So, and for example, in Tornado Cash, this is system of layers, <coughs> and their goal is. The point of the layers is to pay for gas so that users, when they withdraw um, their funds from the mixer, they don't link um, an address uh, that they control with like their new uh, sort of fresh address that's getting the funds. And so, for example, as currently implemented, um, these layers can like, trivially de anonymize users. Um, so they can just listen to each end of the smart contract, um, and, and in quotes, because it's like no end, right? Um, so yeah, they can listen for withdrawals and deposits um, on, uh, on the tonight of cash um, smart contract, and if they were so somewhat malicious, they could easily correlate um, times with, uh, uh, 
times with um, deposits and withdrawals and get some information that way. Uh, and that's why you need to consider the, the network layer. Uh, is that a good example? Does that, does that answer your question, CC? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, that answers the question. Okay. Right. Um, Would you like to ask the design approaches the question? Oh, yeah, like... Um, I'm just reminding him, like, the <laughs> questions that we discussed before, because, yeah. like, you mentioned several research papers, and, like, you recommended us to read it, and we sort of, we sort of read it. Yeah. Well, we sort, <laughs> sort of glimpse. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> uh, yeah, like... Yeah. Um, yeah, let's go ahead. When we tackle the privacy, uh, oh, sorry, internet connection unstable again. Let me see. Okay. Um, when we tackle the privacy uh, problems, uh, it looks like there are some primitives or like categories of approaches that, um, that uh, we like use it very often. Um, like one pattern I observe is the mixer pattern. Uh, we can mix the uh, on-chain uh, uh, senders and receivers. We can also mix the um, like the off-chain uh, network label TCP connections. And um, what are some like other primitives? Um, like what's the toolbox for the privacy uh, solution? Uh, is toolbox. the question is I wonder is the question understandable? <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I understood the question. Uh, so I guess okay, I'll try to answer it and then yeah. tell me if I answer. Um, so yeah, a lot of the times when we're talking about privacy, there's always like. We always bring up Tor or Mixnet, especially nowadays, yeah. um, because they seem to be like the most promising solutions to like network layer privacy. Yeah. Um, but in in the literature, there are other solutions that have been proposed um, with like varying degrees of uh, uh, sort of success, and whether they've been implemented or adopted by any any project, regardless of whether it's like crypto based or other industries, um, those are seldom talked about because oftentimes they were just too inefficient at the time they were published. Um, so a lot of the innovations in um, like anonymity networks were done in like the 2000s. And back then, like, oh, this was very niche. I mean, very few people were using it. So bringing in stuff into production just never really happened. Uh, so, uh, how can I say? Uh, so yeah, so there's like a whole set of stuff that's been ignored. Uh, but some there are some things that are making like resurgence, like mix networks. Um, this work on PC networks, um, like is uh, Blender is like a PC NAT based um, protocol. Um, there's. Uh, there's more work being done to make uh, like PR more practical, or um, that combines PR with these like DC net based things. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the more modern ones do have like research implementations they can look for, but they haven't been like what widely adopted by sort of any industry or project. I don't know if that answers anything. Mm. Yeah. Oh. yeah okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah. I'm, Does that answer your question, or just uh, another another way? Is there any other way to put it so that she can that she can really answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that sort of answers the question because yeah, um, it looks like um, the the field is still uh, very innovative, and there are new approaches, but. Now it's more like the, those approaches, uh, some of them are like less efficient, so we don't see like um, 
um, uh, like a framework of toolbox or 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 mm. yeah, they kind of uh, landscape. But yeah, I think yeah, I think that's the that's that's that answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are there any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Any any questions from the chat box? You can also just email me anything. Yeah. Or like send me a message. Yeah. Don't DM me on Twitter because I'm taking a hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we'll we'll stop here. Yeah, that's yeah. Um yeah. so so thanks thanks Mikara for your time and thanks for getting up so early in Toronto. Yeah. Um so I hope you can visit Taiwan soon. Hopefully this year. Um, so I so it's not it's, it's okay. Hmm? Well uh huh? you haven't wake up already? That's this like seven AM. This is like seven a.m. <laughs> yeah, I wake up. I wake up early. I was just preparing my flight, so I went to bed like at, at like one thirty-five or something, or like two. I went to bed late. Wow. I just, I just. So we would like to have you again. I hope it's it's soon, and I hope to see you in person and like introduce you to everyone. Yeah. yeah. So thanks very much. Um, we will be doing another meetup soon. Susie, do yeah. you know? Or do I know what? Like, is it in June or July? Oh, yeah, we... Uh, so, Stacey has a lot of stuff going on. No, so we... we <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're, our next public event is the Coast Cup at, um, at August. But that's, in August? Yeah, that's... That's, uh, uh, that's too... Like, so, Cloud Open Source Conference is like the biggest conference in biggest open source conference in Taiwan. Yeah, but that's two two months away. But there's one event. Uh, yeah, she would like to announce. What? <laughs> so the the um, so the the next interest the next interesting is um, curated by Oscar from Status. Yeah. The head of engineering. And he recently set up, like, created a, a group on meetup.com, which is Papers We Love, Taipei. And the group is about sharing interesting research papers. And, I'm yeah, and, and, so I'm trying to look for a date. So the date is June 11th, Thursday, 7 p.m. Taiwan time. Uh, it's called Papers We Love Taipei Group. And we will have Ask Status to talk about... Uh, Cadenia. It's the, the, the discovery protocol using that P2P. And you're also going to pick, pay, pick a paper to talk yeah, about? Yeah, I, it's, rather <laughs> it's rather undecided. It's rather undecided. 